Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, the co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, throughout the years of filming Wild Kingdom, we were faced with the grim reality of extinction of some animal species. In the 60s and early 70s, animals were negatively impacted by the loss of habitat and the use of a chemical insecticide known as DDT. Today, DDT has been banned in the United States, and we've made great strides to preserve wide open spaces where animals can thrive. Wild Kingdom made a direct impact on modern captive breeding and release programs. We are now seeing a positive comeback for species like this red-tailed hawk. We must all do our part to continue this progress to protect all animals in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha. Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I wonder how many of you can identify this bird. It's one of the most remarkable birds of prey found in America, the prairie falcon. Falcons are remarkable because of their speed and their courage. Step up. For 4,000 years, men have caught and trained them as hunting birds. This hunter can swoop down on its prey at 180 miles an hour. It has amazing eyesight. It can, it can see its victim from a distance of one and one half miles. If we had eyesight as good as this bird, we could read newspaper headlines a quarter of a mile away. Jim and I ventured into the home of this remarkable bird, a place we call the Land of the Falcon here on the mountain prairies of Wyoming, where falcons, eagles, owls, and hawks, all of the magnificent birds of prey, rule the skies. We set up camp in the heart of falcon country. Here in this magnificent setting of mountains, rolling grasslands, and vast open skies, the prairie falcon, the fastest creature in the world, has room to fly and maneuver in its endless hunt for food. From camp, Jim and I can observe the bird's swift flight and also study the rocky cliffs where the falcon makes its nest, called an eyrie. There may be an eyrie up there. So Jim decides to investigate and then go to another camp where two college students are studying the local birds of prey. Nearing the cliffs, the glasses clearly show a falcon's nest with three chicks in it, about three weeks old. And here comes the mother. But she sees below a great horned owl. He's in for trouble. The falcon won't allow intruders in her territory. The owl better move fast because she means business. That was just a warning to get out and stay out of the falcon's nest area. But the owl ignores it, so now she attacks in earnest. Two pounds of falcon speeding at 180 miles an hour hits a target with the explosive impact of a knockout punch. The battered owl leaves and the prairie falcon goes back to feeding her young. She's made the point, this is her country.
It's not long before another bird of prey who shares this land with a falcon sweeps out of the sky, a young rough-legged hawk. Creeping up on him is tricky, but I manage to get close to the hawk without him seeing me. The rough leg is bigger than the falcon, but it doesn't fly as fast. All of a sudden, he takes off and heads toward a small water hole. It's only then I see the rabbit carcass. He probably killed it earlier and has come back for more. Now, two raccoons appear on the scene, and he's immediately on the alert. It's very likely that they discovered the carcass while the rough leg was absent, and now they think it's theirs. This should be interesting. Raccoons won't give up this easily. His actions and his behavior clearly show that he's young and inexperienced. An older, smarter hawk would never have let two raccoons rob him of his food. He must hunt again. Maybe next time he'll be better at defending his kill. It's early afternoon now at the students' camp. Jeff McPartland and his partner are studying the birds of prey in this area. While I lend a hand with the camp chores, Dave Currents on lookout. His powerful scope suddenly sights a flying object, the master flyer of them all, a peregrine falcon. The peregrine falcon that Dave sighted is a very rare bird, seldom seen in the wild. And this is a unique opportunity to film her. She's after something. Just below us, some very young ducks are swimming in a pond. Their movements have been spotted by the sharp-eyed falcon who's still a half a mile away. Being too young to fly, the ducks instinctively run for a hiding place, but that doesn't discourage the falcon. Two blunder back in the water, and she buzzes them, trying to flush them. The speedy falcon is designed to attack her prey in the air, not on the ground. Two more head for the pond, and at jet speed, the falcon dies. Somehow, the young duck manages to drag his attacker into the water, where the falcon's at a disadvantage and completely out of her element. Now, the duck has a better chance. That's an unusual sight. I've never seen a hunter with the speed, the skill, and the courage of a peregrine falcon so completely outwitted by anything, especially a young duck.
After watching the falcon miss the duck, I realized that this was a good chance to catch it. It would still be hungry and should come to a baited trap. I had just the equipment, some very unusual equipment, an ordinary shovel, and this. Jeff and I finished constructing a trapping device called a headset, which is really a wire frame camouflaged with grass so that the whole thing resembles a clump of grass. I also need the binoculars and something to bait the peregrine falcon to our trap. For that, I'll use a pigeon, and I must take care it doesn't get hurt. Last, the shovel. And leaving Jeff to finish the headset, I go to look for a trapping site. Good, the falcon's still there, and it looks like she's going to stay. This location is ideal for trapping because it's open country and a long, narrow trench can be dug quickly and easily in sandy soil. Soon Jeff arrives with the headset. He's also brought more grass to line the bottom of the trench. Near the lake here, the sand is very damp. So if I'm going to lie here long, I'll need a layer of grass on top too. Something to rest my head on, then Jeff starts to bury me. Only my hands should be free. Then all evidence of our digging must be smoothed over. Next, we'll need the bait. The pigeon has string tied to its leg. By letting the string in and out, I can lure the falcon. Now for the headset. And I become a clump of grass. My human bird trap is all ready for action. A final check. The peregrine hasn't changed position. Until Jeff's well out of the way, I don't want the bird to see the bait. When a pigeon flaps like this, a falcon thinks it's injured and an easy meal. Here she comes. The pigeon's unharmed. The falcon tried scaring it into flight. He's only hitting the wing, but now the falcon's sure he's wounded. Just as she starts to kill, the human trap is sprung. She still doesn't know what's holding her, but when the clump of grass becomes a person, she realizes she's been caught and tries to escape. This is the most difficult part, trying to subdue a terrified bird, and it must be done without harming her.
finished. She must be held gently, but firmly. Then the hood can go on. Hooded, she'll be less frightened. While securing it, the reason for her ineffective hunting becomes plain. There are no talons on one foot. No wonder she missed that duck earlier. The pigeon is quite unharmed by its experience. As this capture is all part of a scientific study of birds of prey, it's necessary for us to put a numbered metal band on her leg. If the bird dies or is recaptured, scientists can trace her migratory movements from the numbered band. Banding details go into a log that Jeff keeps of every capture. All that remains is to let her go. The leather glove protects the hand and helps me to launch her. The hood is loosened. Soon she'll be free again to fly the skies of falcon country. Jim returned to our camp, and the next day we both went on a scouting expedition through the land of the falcon to observe some of the birds of prey more closely. On a far off rock, Jim sees a large bird, making as little noise as possible, we creep closer. There it is the majestic golden eagle, largest and most powerful bird of prey in this area. What a truly magnificent picture. It's time to move on. But suddenly our horses startle a jackrabbit who runs right toward the eagle. This is a perfect setup for trapping it. With fresh cut limbs, we approach the eagle and have no trouble chasing him off the dead rabbit. He flies to a rock about a half a mile away. This is a good spot to build our eagle trap. Close enough so we can keep it under observation but far enough so we won't scare it away. First, we'll build a platform between these two rocks. I'll collect more limbs and the rabbit carcass to use as bait while Jim completes the rest of the trap. A good sturdy pole must be cut. It's needed to hold up the end log. Then a lot of branches will have to be laid over the logs to camouflage the trapper, who will be hiding below. I've got more branches and the rabbit bait. Our trap is almost ready and Jim's going to do the catching. A few more branches to screen off the side, and now we're ready for the bait.
We hope the eagle will return to the rabbit it killed, but didn't have a chance to eat. The line is slipped over the end log so the bait can be held in position. A last tug to make sure all's ready, while I check to see that our bird's still there. Everything is in order. The eagle, seeing one person leave, assumes both have left because birds can't count. This is a good place to hide, well away from the trap site. The movement of the bait soon attracts his attention. Will he go for it? He lands closer. He's been waiting for us to leave so he can finish his meal. He seems suspicious, but soon caution gives way to hunger. the tricky part. Jim's waiting for the right moment. He's got him. Somehow he managed to hold on and the bird's under control and unharmed. Our trap worked. What a fine specimen. This was once called a war eagle because Indians used its feathers for their war headdresses. And I soon find he's pretty warlike. But even if he doesn't like it, the numbered band must go on. It doesn't affect his flying ability, but it does affect his temper. One final thing to be done. Band number, age, sex, location of capture, all must be entered in our logbook, which will later be handed over to scientists who are studying these birds of prey. Now he can be released. The eagle leaves, and we must also leave the land of the falcon. Ancient man admired and often worshipped the birds of prey. In the 18th century, our young country chose, as its national emblem, one of the mightiest, the bald eagle, as a symbol of freedom. Yet in the 20th century, despite all that science has taught us, that these birds are beneficial to mankind because they control rodents and the surplus wildlife population, Modern man, in his ignorance, is destroying them with bullets and insecticides. In spite of game laws, whole species like this prairie falcon are slowly disappearing. If this continues, the land of the falcon may one day vanish from the face of the earth, lost forever from the realm of the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom.
Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.